All right, good morning. It's uh, 1120, which uh, I think is actual uh, starting time. Welcome to the first actual face-to-face -face meeting of the Quantum Internet Research Group. And uh, I am Rod Van Meter. I am one of the co-chairs of the group. I know many of you are in the room, but uh, many of you I don't. Um, so please uh, introduce yourselves when you get a chance. Um, the blue sheets are making their way around the room. And we have both a uh, Jabber scribe and a uh, note taker, I believe. So I think we're in good shape there. OK. Um, just quickly, some administrivia. You know when and where you are. The uh, working group is up in Data Tracker. And there is also a, a mail man mailing list that is up that has been up and running for a while now. And um, this morning, as I was preparing, I, the, uh, the version of the slides that I had still had us marked as a proposed working group. But um, I noticed in Data Tracker this morning that apparently while I was on a plane on my way here yesterday, Allison uh, moved us from proposed to active. So we are now, I guess, a, uh, an officially active RG of uh, IRTF. Um, without yet having strong consensus on the uh, charter for the group. And so I think that's actually one of the number one things we'll need to be working on uh, very actively here, is how to improve the, uh, the charter and get it to uh, what we want. So um, I am one of the co-chairs. The other co-chair is uh, Stephanie Vayner, who is uh, not with us here today. but. Uh, We'll be working with her, and uh, we have in her stead some of uh, some of the people from her uh, group are with us here. So the idea for this group, actually, Stephanie was the one who originated it. Uh, she sent me mail, and uh, I believe at the end of January this year, and said we should consider having a quantum internet research group inside of our IRTF. And I contacted Allison, and she said, "Yeah, that sounds like a great idea." So I presented remotely at the IRTF open session in March of this year. The time, uh, timeline was a little too short for me to get there in person. The mailing list was also opened in March. Uh, it's active and running. The, the uh, volume of traffic on it I would characterize as low to moderate, the, uh, so it will not overload you. And as I said, we were apparently approved as a, uh, an RG on uh, the 6th. Our tentative plan, which uh, Stephanie and Allison and I have discussed, and which we discussed uh, on, online as well, is for QIRG to meet uh, three times a year once at IRTF. Um, I'm proposing that we should plan to meet for, for a, uh, a longer, more extended session at um, Prague in uh, March and once a year at some sort of a quantum conference and once a year virtually or online as a, as a sort of meeting. So that's tentatively what the, what the level of uh, operations is this plant. Um, the quantum meeting, there, a, uh, I will be the general chair of a, the next workshop for quantum repeaters and networks, which will be in fall of 2019, probably early September, and probably in the town of Takamatsu. We're working with the, the hotels uh, to, to nail down uh, dates at the moment. So today's agenda, this sort of administrative trivia stuff just uh, up uh, for the first five minutes. And then we're going to have a, uh, an introductory talk on the quantum internet um, by Axel Dahlberg, who comes from uh, TU Delft, and then Axel will also have the responsibility of presenting the very first internet draft for the uh, QIRG work, which is actually on advertising entanglement capabilities. Then I've set aside 15 minutes for actually talking about the draft charter and finally any other business and open mic for uh, 10 minutes or so. So um, any other comments or additions to this uh, agenda? Any, any bashing that needs to be done on the agenda? If not, then I think we're good. All right, Axel, I think that's going to put you up for the first presentation here. OK. 
Okay, great. Can everybody hear me? Is this on? Yeah. <coughs> okay, cool. Yeah, so I'm Axel Lolberg, and I'm doing uh, my PhD uh, with Stephanie Weiner at QTech in the Netherlands. Um, and I should maybe say as a disclaimer, so my background is uh, physics. And during the last year or so, I've learned more and more about networking and, and routing. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty new in this field, and this is my first IETF meeting, which I found very exciting, and um, I'm, I'm learning a lot. Uh, and I will talk about the quantum internet today, and essentially a way to uh, define certain stages of the quantum internet, and what each stage uh, allows for us to do, what applications we can, we can perform in each stage. Uh, but before I do this, I, I want to give a brief overview of what is the quantum internet and, and what can we do with it. And just uh, to get an, a feeling for who's in the room, um, I wanted to see maybe a raise of hands. For example, who knows what entanglement is? Wow, that's excellent. Okay, like half. I think we know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, so our goal at QTEC is quite ambitious. <laughs> Uh, we would like to enable quantum communication uh, between any points on Earth. Um, and that sounds very cool from a techn technological perspective, um, but why do we want to do this? Why do we want to build a quantum internet? The reason for this is that a quantum internet allows to do many cool applications, which are not possible in what we call the classical internet, or the normal internet. Um, and these things are, for example, the most famous one is uh, quantum key distribution, where you can uh, distribute keys using, using uh, quantum mechanics, and then use these to do uh, secure communication uh, over the standard internet. There are also many other things, like you can, do, you can do secure identification, you can synchronize clocks better, you can extend the baseline of telescopes, or you can even uh, connect small uh, quantum computers through the network and therefore have distributed quantum computation or even blind computer, quantum computation. Uh, so this sounds great, very cool. So why don't we have a quantum internet already if we can all do all these things? Uh, it turns out that building such a network is very hard, both from uh, the point of view of developing the actual hardware to, to be able to do all these things, but also from a software uh, perspective to um, uh, develop all the infrastructure we need to run protocols and to um, uh, control this network. And in QTEC, we have a lot of people working on all these different levels, both in the experimental side and both from the uh, software side. And we're currently now also part of the Quantum Internet Alliance in Europe, mm -hmm. which is a co collaboration between many uh, companies and institutes to actually uh, uh, achieve this. Um, and you might think that why are we already talking about the quantum internet? We don't uh, even have quantum computers yet. Uh, but counterintuitive as it might seem, uh, a quantum internet might be easier than building a quantum computer. Um, the reason for this is that, of course, a quantum computer to be uh, uh, useful, it needs to have more qubits than you can simulate classically on a, on a normal computer. Uh, and this is very, uh, very uh, uh, challenging task. But for many of the applications you can do on a quantum network, you don't require so many uh, qubits per node, as for example for uh, quantum key distribution. And this is because uh, these applications, the security, are guaranteed by uh, a property in quantum mechanics, which is called entanglement. So entanglement has, is uh, a concept that has confused many people, for example, Einstein called it spooky uh, at, the, at the time. Uh, however, since then, we've um, gone quite far in understanding entanglement. Uh, and there are, in fact, two key properties of entanglement, which, if you uh, understand these, gets you quite far in understanding why entanglement is, is useful for applications in a network. The first one is it allows you to have complete coordination which means that if you perform measurements on two qubits that are entangled, the measurement outcomes will be perfectly correlated, uh, even though uh, individually they're actually uh, random. This is very useful for doing uh, tasks which um, requires coordination between parties in a network. Furthermore, one can prove formally in 
um, due to quantum mechanics, that entanglement is inherently private, which means that no one else can have a share in, in uh, uh, maximal entanglement between parties. Or in other words, no one can essentially eavesdrop on these uh, correlations that are being produced, uh, which is uh, perfectly suitable for, for example, uh, key distribution. Um, and um, so entanglement uh, can be produced in a network in, in different ways, but usually this concerns sending photons, for example, through a fiber, either to a midpoint or between parties. And of course, to, to have a, 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 an interesting network, we don't want to put fibers between any two pairs of, of, of nodes in the network. Uh, and you might then wonder, how do we produce entanglement between parties that are not uh, directly connected? And there is, in fact, a way to do this. So uh, one can produce entanglement between two directly connected nodes and also between uh, two other directly connected nodes. And this midpoint can essentially do an operation and a measurement and send classical messages to the endpoints, which effectively produces entanglement uh, between the, the end nodes. This is either called sometimes teleportation or entanglement swap. Uh, and, the, and the order a device that does this in a network, we usually call a quantum repeater. Uh, and a network might look something like this. There are end nodes that are running the application. There are repeaters that extends the entanglement in the network between the end nodes. Um, and at QTEC, we're actually trying building this uh, type of network right now. And in 2015, we made uh, uh, the first what's called a loophole free bell test, which is essentially a test that, uh, without any doubt, guarantees that you actually had entanglement. Um, and our next step in, in this endeavor is to build the first quantum link uh, between uh, the two cities of uh, Delft and The Hague at about uh, 25 kilometers. Uh, and this is our first step towards building our uh, demo network in the Netherlands between four cities, which our aim is that this network will be universally programmable. Um, this is not only a challenge in terms of developing the, the hardware that is needed, but it's also a challenge in developing the software. Uh, for example, to achieve this, uh, one thing that we need to develop is a network stack for a quantum network which, uh, as you all, many of you probably know, that this is a highly non-trivial task. Um, and we have some uh, uh, proposal of what the quantum network stack might look like in a, in a, in, in a quantum network. Uh, but I don't have time to go into this in detail uh, right now, but maybe this is something that is interesting to discuss, uh, for example, in the next uh, QIRG meeting. Um, but what I want to talk about now is uh, we have recently proposed uh, essentially six stages of a quantum network uh, with requirements on what type of operations you can do in the network and then what each stage allows you to do in terms of applications. And I would like to just point out that the network we're trying to build in essentially two or three years will be on this fourth st stage uh, uh, here. Um, so my plan is to essentially uh, go through each of these stages and what requirements they uh, uh, they have, and then what uh, what uh, um, applications they allow you to perform. Um, maybe are there any questions at this point? Uh, or any uh, inputs? Okay, cool. Um, so the the first stage in in a quantum network is actually the current status of, of, of this field, uh, what's been implemented in reality. Uh, and we, we, def we call this the trusted repeaters. And in a trusted repeater network, uh, one can essentially, through the, the, links the physical links between the nodes, uh, produce key using quantum key distribution. However, why, why this is called trusted repeater is because if two nodes that are not physically connected want to communicate using this key, uh, they of course need to trust the, the middle node uh, through uh, using both of these pairs of keys. This is why it's called trusted repeater. And this, is, this stage is slightly different from the other stages because it doesn't actually uh, effectively uh, allow for any quantum communication between the nodes. 
the next step is called a prepare and measure uh, network, where essentially a node can prepare a qubit state and send it to another node, which can perform a measurement. This then actually allows to do quantum key distribution uh, between any pair of nodes in the network, even if they are not uh, uh, directly connected. And it also allows for other uh, uh, applications, such as secure identification. Um, the next step in this in these stages uh, is when you also can actually produce entanglement. Uh, so in this stage, one can uh, generate entanglements between nodes, and both nodes can then measure uh, the qubits that are in this entanglement. Uh, this allows to do essentially the same protocols, but in a device-independent setting, where de device-independent means that you don't really need to trust that your devices do what they're supposed to do. Uh, even the adversary could have produced the devices you use to generate, for example, key. Um, in the next step, one can, additionally to producing entanglement, also store the entanglement in memory uh, and do operations to this entanglement. Uh, and this, in this stage, which we're actually trying to build uh, in two or three years, uh, then opens up a lot of new exciting applications. Uh, for example, uh, simple leader election protocols uh, or blind quantum computation. Um, and then going up further, uh, I guess also further in the future, uh, one can envision that each node can have a few uh, fault tolerant qubits, which means that uh, you can essentially, by adding more qubits or making them a logical qubit by encoding them using error correction, you can uh, reduce the, the noise you apply when you do gates uh, indefinitely. However, the number of logical qubits you have at this stage is still uh, possible to simulate classically. That's what differenti differentiates this stage from the, the last stage, which is maybe the, the ultimate stage of the quantum network, where we actually essentially have connected uh, quantum computers uh, in a network. <laughs> So these are the, the stages we uh, have proposed, and uh, are there any questions or discussions? So I have an ignorant person's question. Yeah. Um, is it possible to describe the information? You introduce sorry, yourself. Sorry, I would do that. Uh, Aaron Falk, uh, Akamai Technologies. Um, is it possible? To, is there a zeroth order uh, network where you are using uh, binary information to dis, uh, to communicate between quantum computers? And is that a useful thing? And, um, I mean, look, so you know, you said connection. you started out by saying uh, you, ah, know, you want a quantum network, but it seems to me that uh, you know, if you network quantum computers and use it using conventional technologies, mm -hmm. is there any value to that? That might be something that is you know rapidly achievable and will have some some. Uh, the, we don't have quantum yeah, so in, possibly I, I don't know if that would allow you to do anything more than probably not than doing whatever a quantum computer can do. Um, but I guess I'm trying to make the distinction, the distinction between using quantum technology in the endpoints and uh, carrying it over the network. And, yeah, uh, yeah, and yeah. it looks like you're focusing really on carrying it on the network. And I'm trying to understand if there's any value in, uh, in looking at sort of other points in that space. So like I, I said, it's an ignorant question. Yeah. No, it's a good question. So I don't know any uh, anything that that would allow you to do, which you cannot do essentially with just having a quantum computer. Uh, and I just, as my guess is that uh, uh, a quantum computer will not uh, be built before any of these things happen. All right, I'll take, I'll take Chair's prerogative there and st stick in one, one comment. Actually, there, there is a, uh, a proof that if you just take two classical computers of a certain size and connect them together with, with, with only a classical channel, you get no net improvement in the computational capability over just having the two individual quantum computers. So it doesn't get you a big the, the big gain you, you might hope for. So ultimately, we do need this quantum to quantum communication to scale quantum computation. All right, uh, one more question here, and then we'll go on to the, the next one. And if there are any other questions, we can save those for the open mic at the end here. You have a question, Huawei. Um, ninth question. So you are talking about entanglement, 
but you haven't mentioned once the coherence. So the question is, can you do that? For, and is it an important topic to say, if you create entanglement, how do you uh, maintain it? Uh, definitely, that's a good question. Um, uh, so I can say that I will talk briefly about this in, in the next presentation, actually. Uh, and there are things that you can do if, you, if your links, uh, if you can only produce entanglement with a certain fidelity or with some amount of noise. You can also distill entanglement. And distill here means that if you produce sort of two bad entangled links, you can effectively combine them to a better entangled links. Uh, something like uh, close to how you distill, let's say, whiskey. Uh, so you can improve the entanglement even though you start off with a with a noise entanglement. Uh, but then there's of course the question of decoherence. So if you want to store the entanglement, uh, uh, quantum memories are inherently noisy. Uh, so this you of course need to overcome. Uh, and this is also part of this fifth stage, uh, where you can do uh, gates in a fault tolerant manner. So uh, it's a very important question, um, but I don't have time to fully talk about this now. All right, with that, let's go on to the, uh, the uh, next actual presentation. Um, this the, uh, is the first internet draft out of uh, QIRG, and the first author of this, uh, Kiriti, actually was here earlier this week but couldn't stay for Thursday, and I couldn't get here any earlier. So. Um, he asked uh, Axel to take on uh, the process of explaining this one. Yeah, yeah so this draft concerns uh, advertising entanglement capabilities. Uh, for example, as you mentioned, uh, how much decoherence you have when you try to generate entanglement. Uh, and this idea came up in a, in a hackathon we organized three or four weeks ago uh, on the quantum internet. Uh, and this uh, was the core idea was originated from Kareti Melchior from Juniper and, and Stephanie Rayner at that time. Uh, and uh, later, uh, Christian also joined from, from Reddit. Um, uh, and so, as mentioned, we cannot produce entanglement perfectly. They will necessarily be, uh, it will be noisy. And uh, the question is how do we communicate this in the network to make good decisions of uh, uh, um, how to produce the entanglement in the network? So I've already mentioned some brief things about entanglement, so I don't need to say this again. Uh, um, but I should maybe say that one might ask, what does good entanglement mean or what does bad entanglement mean? And one can quantify how noisy entanglement is in what's called the fidelity. It essentially means how close am I to having essentially perfect entanglement. And of course, the, the fidelity will then decrease when you have decoherence in quantum memories. Um, but this we need to then communicate. Yeah. Find perfect entanglement. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Making references to other subjective edges on help. Yeah, so th there's a notion of maximal entanglement in, 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 in quantum mechanics, where essentially means that you're, so I don't know how much I can explain for this in a, in a way that doesn't require any quantum mechanics. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> can you? <laughs> um, uh, so essentially, this means that if if you have maximal entanglement, uh, what I said earlier that if you measure your 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 qubits, you will always receive perfect correlation between your measurement outcomes. But then, if your state is not maximally entangled, you don't always get uh, the same measurement outcome right? that is perfect correlations. So you can quantify how noisy your your state is by checking on how many times do I don't get my expected uh, measurement outcome. Sure, why not? Let's make this interactive. Go ahead. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a clarification question. Yeah. Can you just say if you change the state of a qubit in one spot, and if it's tangled with a qubit somewhere else with no physical medium between it other than space, the state will change. So if I set a one bit in the qubit here, mm -hmm. it'll be one over there. Is that a true or false statement? So it will change the, the state, uh, but... Uh, um, it will not change the, the statistics of your of measuring the other the other qubits. However, it will change the correlations between the measurement outcomes. This means that there's no information being sent because uh, from the point of view of the other 
qubits, if you look at that locally, the, the probability of receiving certain out measurement outcomes doesn't change, but it's the correlation between uh, these measurement outcomes that change. I don't know if that satisfies your, <laughs> your question, but we can talk more about it afterwards. If you want. Um, so um, a, a quantum network might look something like this, where we have uh, uh, quantum nodes which can store and manipulate qubits. They can also send uh, quantum uh, information between the nodes. But there's also on top of this, uh, of course, uh, uh, classical control nodes that essentially tells uh, what the quantum node should do, and they can also communicate classically. Uh, there might also be, uh, so in, in here we assume that essentially the classical network uh, uh, essentially parallels the quantum network. There might also be uh, classical connections uh, which where there is no quantum connection, but for sake of keeping it uh, simple right now, I, we will ignore these. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if, if two nodes which are not directly connected uh, wants to share entanglement to do some protocol, they would need to uh, produce entanglement on these shorter links, and then essentially these, these midpoint nodes uh, essentially do some a measurement and sends uh, classical measurement outcomes to the end nodes, uh, and we will then have entanglements between these nodes. Uh, but the question is now, if, if let's say the network looks like this, um, uh, how do we decide if we should take, for example, this path or this path? Uh, this is a, not a trivial question to answer because, for example, we might be able to generate entanglement faster here, but we might be able to generate uh, less noisy entanglement in, in this direction. And as I mentioned, one can also do distillation. So one can produce two entangled pairs here distill them to make a better pair. Um, so this uh, complicates the question of, should we go up or should we go below? So in this proposal, we don't answer how to answer this question. We only want to uh, answer uh, how should we uh, advertise the cap capabilities of the links such that uh, a decision could be made uh, with some algorithm. Um, and the features that sort of uh, are important to know to make such a decision is, for example, of course, what's the topology of the of the network itself? What are the possible paths? Uh, what are the capabilities of each node? Essentially, how many qubits does it have? Uh, uh, for example, how many qubits can I have in memory? Uh, and of course, what's the capabilities of each link? Uh, how good, <coughs> in some way, possibly in, uh, in terms of fidelity? Uh, can I produce entanglement uh, in this link, and how fast? And am, am I able to distill this entanglement? Uh, so the proposal of this graph is to use, uh, uh, essentially run a link state protocol uh, to advertise these, uh, these capabilities of the links, uh, and add each of these, these properties of the links as uh, TLVs to the link state protocol. Uh, and then each, each control node learns uh, all the capabilities of the links in the network and can then possibly make uh, decisions of uh, which path to take. Um, so, and I mentioned essentially all of these uh, properties before. Uh, one thing that we should maybe uh, mention is that uh, Rod has already had a proposal of this in 2013, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, where they essentially define the cap capability or the cost of, of, of a link as the, the inverse of the throughput of this link. Uh, so this may be good to have a discussion of uh, uh, between these two suggestions. Um, um, because for example, uh, whether or not you can do a distillation between nodes might be important to make such dis dis decisions. Um, so uh, through, to this draft, there's a lot of uh, steps to still be taken. Uh, so from QTEC, we're sort of biased towards uh, a specific implementation of, of a quantum network using uh, nitrogen vacancy centers in diamonds. But it's also good to know, uh, does this proposal also make sense for people that use other implementations, such as trapped ions or uh, neutral atoms or something else? Um, 
And we also want to put a short uh, document on archive uh, to explain a bit more uh, about the actual uh, uh, theory behind this and uh, about entanglement and fidelity and decoherence and so on to hopefully answer many of these questions that already came up here. Um, so maybe questions to the to the to the research group itself is does this fit into the to the charter and uh, uh, is the mailing list a good good place to uh, discuss this? And, uh, yeah. This being my first time actually chairing a uh, an RG or or a WG. In fact, I'm a, I'm a little fuzzy on details of the process itself. This uh, draft showed up with the label QIRG on it directly, but uh, the uh, the group itself has not yet taken on responsibility for it. Looks like Aaron has a comment on that. Sure, uh, Aaron Falk has a former IRTF chair since Allison's not here. I can advise you that uh, as the chair of the research group, you can run it in any way you see fit. <laughs> um, if you want people to show up and participate, I suggest that you try not to annoy too many people in the room, so you might want to consider that when you make your decisions, but um, this isn't an IETF working group. You don't need to run a consensus process, and so I suggest that you do choose a process that's going to work for keeping people engaged and making progress and trying to achieve the goals that you want. Otherwise, you know, whatever you like. Certainly, I'm perfectly happy to have it as, as, one of, as the first item on our agenda, working agenda, so it's totally fine by me. And the other, the other co-chair is one of the co-authors on, on the draft, so presumably she approves too. So. Other questions, let's see, is that it for the presentation? Yep. Yeah. Other questions? Um, and state your name, please. Uh, this is, <coughs> is Dino. So Aaron asked the question, is there any value to run two quantum computers through a classical network? And you said there was no value add. So to move these properties, we would need this classical um, network. So uh, it sounds like this is getting, this is too far ahead of the game. We need to understand more fundamentals before we say how to do things, right? That's my gut reaction to this proposal. So if there's no value to have a classical internet between quantum computers, then why are we designing and putting a solution in place to put properties of quantum properties in a routing protocol that runs on a classical network? So to clarify, so this is a, here you have classical communication between the nodes together with quantum communication between the nodes. Uh, and I think the question was whether, whether you only have classical communication, but no quantum if, communication. If we want maximum value, or maybe even a little bit of value, we should have quantum nodes talk on a quantum internet without a classical network. Shouldn't we, st shouldn't we shoot for that as a goal? Sorry, Dina. Uh, Why Alice, do we want to shoot? Uh, uh, so if, I think if I'm understanding your question right, that that's what Axel or, or uh, Kiriti is actually proposing here. This is classical routing to control the quantum network. Right. So, uh, uh, so that, uh, that, interject. Maybe we can Alistair Woodman here. Uh, so your name, name, please. Alistair Woodman, NetDev. Um, the I think you've. We're, we're trapped in a corner case of looking at quantum computing for quantum networking for quantum computing, which is, a, I think, a corner case question. The more interesting question, which I don't think anybody clearly articulated, is what are the practical uses of quantum networking for non-quantum computers? Is there any value to anybody to be able to see? So you're talking about key distribution or mm -hmm. yeah, faster throughput. There's a whole bunch of things out there that people are excited about, which may get people here in this room interested in what you're doing without the corner case thing of making both quantum computing and quantum networking work, which is probably 50 years away or wherever that is, right? <laughs> but but there may be shorter term practical in, interest here. And I think you're ducking the, what would I do with quantum networking with existing compute stuff? Yeah. Where's the value there? So I should maybe say that, so this proposal of the different stages is also in a in an article on science. So if you want to read more about what you can actually do in these different stages, you can also have a look at. QKD is the, is the obvious example, the quantum key distribution that already exists. Um, you know, it's, it's an application for classical communications that uses sort of a minimal set of capabilities in, in the quantum world. And so part of the work item that's, that's on, on the, uh, the agenda is to figure out that full 
set of steps that go, the applications that go with the uh, the uh, stages that Axel presented, so to go from there. <coughs> Igor Briskin, Huawei, I think the proposal is <coughs> very similar to proposal of uh, having, for example, a control plane uh, that uh, controls the optical network. Okay, so uh, in this case, uh, we have a control plane which uh, have normal communication between the nodes, which uh, basically auto discover the property of the quantum links. Uh, for example, how many qubits you can have, how, what's the quality and stuff like that. And this knowledge will uh, make it possible to create a quantum links, right, between uh, say uh, node X and node Y and <coughs> provide the correlation uh, like, uh, to actually establish, say, end-to-end -end entanglement between uh, two nodes. Does it sound uh, like an accurate uh, description? Um, yes, I, th I think so. If I understood you correctly, yes. Uh, I mean, we will definitely need classical communication between the nodes to, to build the quantum network. Uh, that's without a doubt. Uh, for example, only to, for example, synchronize the nodes. Uh, if you want to send out photons, you need the photons to arrive at the same time. And this you need to synchronize. Um, however, this proposal is simply to also uh, advertise the, the capabilities of each link uh, to make better decisions. So, it's, uh, <laughs> this is uh, approximately the same way as we, for example, control optical trail, right? It's it's not really uh, like a normal communication, it's just a data plane of, uh, in optics. But uh, we do uh, exchange information, like routing information about the capability of optical links. So we, we could produce say end-to-end -end optical trail uh, with certain characteristics uh, <coughs> along the trail. So, so if I understood you correctly, and the goal is to, to create a, a entanglement between, uh, say, two uh, either directly or non directly connected nodes, mm -hmm. then I would need to, to know the topology of my quantum links and, and intermediate points and set up uh, the, uh, this uh, <coughs> entanglement in such a way that it, it will work end to end. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's make this last question for now. Okay, um, Dan Bogdanovich. Uh, I'm a little bit, you know, conf confused with this request and um, essentially in, in this draft I'm trying to think about. But one thing which is much more interesting thing to me is how to carry more information in a single photon over the network. Because th this could vastly improve the capacity that we need <clears throat> and probably yeah, it sounds crazy, but you know, it could end up being cheaper than how we are doing the optical networks today. So that's one area that uh, you know I occasionally read upon, and is and is quite interesting. So um, using classical networks to distribute information, whatever that information is, I mean, we've been we've been doing that, and um, I I mean I I I fail to see here. Um, I mean, there are some problems, but I don't understand them. But I said that's one one of the areas that would be very interesting to me. Uh, Robert Groberg here. Um, one suggestion, right, just to get everybody up, right? Would you might want to use Q QKD as an example with trusted notes, the way things are done today, and untrusted notes, and and that might educate people in a fairly simple way. You know how you know the, the simplest thing that you could do with a quantum network, right? As a comparison, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Right, because it's just you know the issue of using you know ISIS or TLVs to explain fidelities and things like that. We already have that concept, right? For for you know best path and things like that, right? So using this in the quantum space is pretty simple, but I think people are having a hard time understanding why. So you mean as an example for yeah, quantum Q, internet? Q, Q, QKD is a really simple example, yeah, right? Yeah. That people understand, I think, at some level, QKD, right? And so I actually had the, the slide in the in the uh, the previous presentation talking about the trusted repeaters. Did that not come through? No, I don't think so. 
<laughs> people think people think of you know Beijing to Shanghai, right? Is you know QKD across all these multiple hops, where it really isn't, right? So I think we have one question from from uh, via, from uh, online. Is that I push the red button. All right. Do I have to hold it? They may have. Did, I think it was Melchior, but he may have stepped out of the queue. I no longer see him listed up here. Melchior, question online. Okay, now I think we got you. Hey guys, um, it, I'm Melchior Amos. I'm one of the co-authors of the draft. So I think we might need to be more clear on what the objective is we want to uh, uh, get to. So we were, our intention is to um, uh, distribute um, uh, data and information we need in order to form the entanglements, right? Um, so the, the endpoints need a way to communicate with each other. Um, and to distribute uh, the information they would need to build that entanglement. Um, so yes, agreed with the uh, previous speakers that uh, ideally you would not need extra links or a classical network. The fact is now that we do need that at this point. Um, so I just wanted to state that, uh, thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'd like to cut this off here so that we can go on to the uh, last couple of things on the agenda because we only have about 19 minutes left. Um, Axel, thanks. Let's see. Um, the, uh, the other item, I may have lost a link to this. Hang on. The, uh, I do not have separate slides for, for um, the... Uh, for the uh, draft charter. So let me pull that up here. Hang on. All right. Tell you what, let's do it this way. Um, I thought I had this up in, in the in, in a tab, and I realized I don't. Not, sorry about that. Mailing list. Yeah, archives. Yeah, the the one that's actually in Data Tracker was was just a placeholder, and I thought it was I thought it was the, the whole thing. All right, let me see if I can uh, pull this up in a way that's reasonable. Make this bigger. Not having the ability to pull this up larger. All right, so um, the charter, this I sent out to the uh, mailing list just on Tuesday. Um, if you want to look at it, you can pull it up online through the, through the mailing list uh, archives. The, the set of kinds of problems, there's a sort of a prologue with, with this the set of kinds of problems uh, include routing and resource allocation and connection establishment, which is one of the things we've been working on lately, interoperability between different kinds of networks, security of the system uh, of internet, of quantum internet operations, as well as uh, um, you know, the end-to-end -end applications, and design of an API that will serve the same role that uh, sockets performs in, in the classical internet, which I think is actually related to uh, some of Axel's own current work, although he didn't talk about it today. Um, but there are also a set of other problems, including the, uh, the applications for a quantum internet, which, we, which has already been brought up here a couple of times, figuring out how to take that set of six stages that, that Vayner and company have proposed and figure out what applications each of those will do with relatively concrete use cases for each one, I think is one of the big items for the entire community, not just for you know, a, a handful of people here and there. Um, and then a little farther away, there have already been people who've been working on how to build not just 
entanglement between two nodes, but, ha but how to make use of larger entangled states that cover multiple uh, systems. And so that can be something that's farther on down the line. Um, for outputs and milestones, two concrete suggestions that I had are first an architectural framework that delineates the types of nodes. One of the figures that Axel put up there, he mentioned repeater and I think there was switch and there was end node on, on the, uh, the list. Is that a complete taxonomy of the types of nodes that we have? Um, this I think has been brought up before that we need some sort of shared common vocabulary in order to move forward, in order to actually take steps toward, toward a, a complete network architecture. Um, so I think that, plus working on these, uh, this set of concrete use cases, plus uh, the, you know, now the third item also the, of the, uh, this draft for uh, routing that, that uh, um, uh, Kiridi actually wrote, I think that gives us a, a, a solid first three items on our work agenda here. And as I said in the introductory uh, comments, I think the plan is to meet once a year here at IETF, IRTF, once a year at a quantum uh, conference, and once a year online. Um, so I want to open the floor up to comments on this draft uh, charter. So far, you know, this is you know, essentially first light for this charter. No one but me has, uh, has seen this and looked at it, so I would like to have uh, your all's feedback on this. Hi, Aaron Falk. Um, so one of the questions uh, I think that you have to ask when you're creating a new research group is, um, you know, uh, does the existence of the research group, is it going to bring in the right communities that you want to collaborate? Um, you know, just judging by the number of people in the room, you've gotten the attention inside the IETF. I'm um, thrilled. So for those of you who are online and can't see the room, uh, I haven't seen the blue sheets yet, but we've had 80 or 90 people at least in the room here. Yeah, I'd say I'd say about 100. Yeah, I think um, it's probably close to 100. And um, but the, but I guess the question that I have is like this: there's a lot. Uh, the topics that you've got here uh, rely on domain expertise that is not sort of the core IETF expertise. And so, are you going to be able to get those people in the room? Have they already shown interest? You know, I uh, I don't know enough to recognize you know um, the individual names. So I'm just sort of asking this of you. Yeah. The uh, the physicists, certainly the people who are the experimentalists who are building these systems, certainly have none of the knowledge that's in this room. And the question is, do they recognize it? Do they think that that's important? And are they willing to come and participate in it? That's, that's the open question right now. Um, this, the EU Quantum Internet Alliance that Axel presented is probably the, the largest coordinated effort on, on the planet at the moment. So clearly we need the involvement of some, some of those people. If we don't, you know, if this forks off from, from what those folks are doing, then this RG will have no impact on what they actually built. Right? So it's absolutely critical that we have some involvement with them. Axel's a, a theorist and a software guy. Stephanie herself used to work for some ISP in Europe before, before moving into quantum. But the other key part of, of the Delft group over there is actually a guy named Ronald Hansen, who's the leading experimentalist in, uh, and, doing, and building these systems that he's talking about. So they sit in the same building. Um, so at least on one key hardware project, there is direct collaboration going on and a path for people in this room to influence what that group does is through Axel and Stephanie. That's sort of a, what you might call a, a second class route to getting things done. We would be much, much, much better off if we can get some of them to actually show up in person and actually contribute on the mailing list. And so I think a, uh, a key goal actually is if we're going to meet face to face in Prague is that we need to say, you know, if QIRG is going to be viable, we must have at least one experimentalist in the room in Prague. Hi, this is Dino. Um, I think that group of researchers or the physicists have to actually teach us, because if we don't understand the underlying properties, then we don't know what the value is. We can't make mm -hmm. good trade-offs, that sort of thing. So yes, they have to, we have to influence each other, but I think more to the point is uh, we, we have to be taught by the physicists and we have to teach you guys about networking, right? The same sort of thing. Yeah, the, uh, I mentioned uh, in my opening remarks that the third workshop for quantum repeaters and networks, 
the first one was, let's see, so 2019, 20, 2015, and in that one, we actually started with a half-day tutorial, and we had people like Paul Makapetris and Bill Manning and Kaveh Salamathian show up, show up for that. We would be totally on board with doing that again anytime, any place that, that, that makes sense. So if we want to do a, a half-day tutorial on what quantum networking is in Prague, if people would be up for that, I will, I will totally put it together. You know, we'll, we'll put together multiple speakers and we'll bring people and do it. If people are willing to commit you know, to, to spending you know, several hours sitting in the room to learning about it. Okay, how about show of hands for people who, who would sit in, sit in a room for a half a day to learn about quantum networking in Prague. All right, that's 80% that's of, of the room. So I, th I think that's a yes. All right, that's on the agenda for, for Prague. I'll make it happen. Uh, yeah, Michael Arbenz, I, I, I agree about the uh, educating us about it and um, educating the people there about routing. And, and I think the, uh, from my limited understanding, this uh, the analogy about setting controlling an optical network is, I think, seem to be the closest we have so far um, of what this is. I mean, we don't really need to know the details of what the photons that are going on, as long as we understand the properties and the optimizations that should be done. And it could also be that what you need is not what we have done here previously when it comes to like optimizing the path or, I mean, people know a lot about those kind of optimizations here. So if there is anything, I mean, if you don't want us to know and we just want a routing protocol and you put in, if you can elaborate on exactly what you need and the optimizations you want the routing protocol to do, we can probably do it. But if we understand it better, we can probably do a better job. Um, but I think it's all about a, under, n perhaps we don't need to understand the, you know, physics, but we under, need to understand enough about the properties and the, the requirements <laughs> that need to be done. Um, so, and, the, and finding analogies, I think, also for people who are not in, heavy in physics background. Eric Nordmark, this might be a bit of a nit, but if you scroll down to the end, there was something about working with other STOs, which sort of stood as like um, coordination point with other standards organizations. I mean, inviting people to participate from a research perspective is fine. You don't want to put yourself in a space where they will send you liaisons and expect you to respond, because <laughs> that's not something that research groups typically do. And you know, Good point. The IETF can do that because it's an, an STL, right? But but yeah, invite people that are doing research. So. Yeah, I want I want the, the weakest possible word that, that would include this. Maybe the weakest possible thing is to actually delete it. I'm not sure. But, but, but yeah. um, for those of you who don't know, there is work going on. Both both the ITU and IEEE have, have started um, some efforts around standardization of quantum networks. Nothing that's quite that's looking quite as far forward as the total set of things that Axel uh, talked about so far today. It's much more short term. For for example, the IEEE group is working on uh, essentially uh, open flow control of QKD flows on trusted repeater networks. There's an IEEE project that has been stood up that's been doing that and they've been working for I think about two years on it yes I don't know what to do that information uh, Alistair would <laughs> uh, net uh, so again I, I'm maybe I'm speaking just for myself but the, the, there's uh, and I'm a physicist so I might uh, be a, at a slight disadvantage here but but y you're you're not doing a good job of sort of articulating we, we saw the roadmap thing what we didn't see, I'm sure there's a bunch of people in here, and we heard from one speaker already, that, that want to know when we're going to get more bandwidth than we had before. There are some people here in the room who want things to happen instantaneously across the planet, right? And, and there's no clear statement about when you think those things may happen from a temporal standpoint in our world, right? At the moment, I'm guessing you're going to be talking about you know 9,600 board communications for the <laughs> next five years. Maybe it would be a good idea to tell everybody that because maybe a lot of people would just go, "Oh, thank you, I can move on." Right? So, so there's a specific set of things you're you're looking to get skill sets in, right? And maybe the socket stuff is a good area, and all those other. There's a whole bunch of people here turned up to to understand what's going on, and maybe we do need a full 
you know, a half day to talk about that. But there's, I think there's a very highest level, there's no clear understanding about when's this going to inflect and in what particular applications does anybody expect this to inflect. All right, then, that, I mean, yeah. become mass interestedly useful for people or do you need people to build boxes or what, what do you need? Right, because I think we, we've got very disparate skill sets here, and I'm guessing you can use 10 to 20 percent of the people here, and the other 80 percent of the people are just trying to figure out, and they will figure out at some point that this is not their space for the next 10 years. And, and sorting that thing out earlier would help. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. Actually, the the uh, when that question was was sort of, when that point sort of went by during during the Q and A about. Uh, Axel's first presentation. I sort of deliberately didn't interrupt and say that because I didn't want to derail the presentation. But if you are thinking that quantum is a possible way to get higher bandwidth out of your networks, you're thinking wrong, right? <laughs> That's not on the agenda, right? So the data rates that that, that people are talking about so so far, um, the quantum key distribution, the point-to-point -point boxes, some of those go as high as what, maybe a megabit per second or something. Um, although that's sort of there are possible big leaps that could be could be had on top of that. Um, but for these entangled networks, the people who are doing this, the group in Delft that's doing this over two kilometers of fiber on the Delft campus, their data rates for doing this are creating six entangled states per second, is that right? Oh, they're, they're, they're up to 30 now, sorry, that's right. In fact, Ronald told me that when I saw them recently. They're up to 30 entangled entangled states per second on this. So the point in doing this is not bandwidth, right? Any, any sort of thought of that needs to just, you know, walk right out the room right, right now. Um, the point in doing this is with those entangled states, you can do certain things in new ways that, that circumvent that need for, for more bandwidth or more or, or fewer rounds of, of communication in particular is, is one common one. So I divide the, the uh, applications up into essentially three areas that are sort of similar to what Axel talked about. One's distributed computing, which is relatively straightforward, and we talked about that. The second one is cryptographic protocols, which includes QKD. And the point of QKD is not to generate keys faster than you can make can, than you can do them with Diffie Hellman, it's to get new security capabilities that you don't have in existing software systems. And similarly with quantum Byzantine agreement, which would also be in the same area, in theory it's going to give us um, better security properties than existing cryptographic based Byzantine agreement protocols. Whether or not that's really true in practice, I think is is very much an open question and need, needs further discussion. And then the third area, which Axel also mentioned, is that these can actually be used to enhance the precision of sensor networks, including things like interferometry between large radio telescopes or large optical telescopes, for example. So in you know, those three areas. But none of this is about bandwidth. We're not going to be talking about, oh, quantum networks lets you go from, from 40 gigabits per second to, to a terabit per second on a fiber. That's not the point. Yes, question. Uh, uh, my name is Igor Priskin, and I'm a specialist in the optical control plane. Uh, I have very limited understanding of optical uh, data plane, uh, but uh, still, uh, if uh, we managed to describe the optical networks and the optical links and also optical nodes and what constitutes a good optical path, and uh, based on this knowledge, we could run uh, various optimization algorithms and can uh, make it happen, make uh, optical OCNR like, uh, uh, reasonable and the signal uh, readable and so forth without actually full understanding <coughs> what's happening in the optical data plane. So what, what I'm saying is that we can have a very similar paradigm in cooperation between I say ITF specialists and uh, quantum physics. Okay, we still we do need <laughs> some limited uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, we, we do need to understand what's the underlying processes happening, but uh, we can also uh, basically take uh, advantage of all the knowledge we've had so far. 
Thank you. That was just a comment, right? I don't need to respond to that. Thanks. So, um, let's make this the last question because it's now 12.20. So, um, Stuart Bryant, I'm, I'm very much a novice on this, but uh, two, two, two observations. First off, um, the time transfer um, solution is one that is taxing the network industry. Some of the new radios, particularly you know, 5G and presumably what goes on afterwards, have critical requirements on exact time transfer that stress uh, GPS um, to its limit. So there's a major win um, to be had in that. And time is not a high bandwidth thing because after once you know the time, then you know you know it, right? So, so that's a, a, a really important area, I think, to, to think about. The other thing is that observed a paradox in what was being described. If the function of one of the functions of quantum networking is to improve the security of a network, how do you use a classical network to connect nodes together, which is presumably vulnerable to classical security errors? I don't see how you get the bootstrap to work that way around. Ah, you've asked the million dollar question there. Um, the, uh, part of the answer to that is that, in fact, some, some of these uh, security protocols that, that depend on end-to-end -end entanglement allow the two end nodes to confirm with each other that, that they act, that, that they actually um, believe that there is no one in the communication channel. But if if these if that if their classical communication can be disrupted in real time, including the breaking of whatever encryption they're using for for, for that classical entanglement, yeah, you've got a, you've got a, a chicken and egg problem there. It's an open question. Um, let's see. It is now 12.21. Probably, people are probably in, interested in lunch. Um, I hope this has intrigued all of you, and we will work to have a, uh, a half-day session available in um, Prague, a tutorial session. Please join the, uh, the uh, mailing list. There are reference materials, including for beginners, available in the mailing list archives. And if anybody's actually interested, Shota Nagayama, who's sitting right up here in the front, is putting a group of, group of people together to go to dinner and talk about this tonight. So find Shota if you're interested. Thank you all for coming. And if you haven't signed the blue sheets, please do so. And where are they? Hi. Nice to meet you. Uh, I have a couple of document numbers, but, but there's a there's a, a proposal from SK Telecom, and they are working with uh, with eBay Quantity, which is one of the eBay box providers. Of I don't know much about it. I don't do any IT stuff at all. But one of one of the uh, one of the, no, no, that's the, that's the, the guy that, that, I, that I'm on in the organization is still one of the Japanese government's advisors on the smart issues. So he asked me about we don't like that. So we do three or four months. He sent me a couple of draft documents and, and asked my opinion on them, and I took sent him my opinion. So. Uh, I would like to do it earlier than we do because I need to be back in Japan. That's your question.